Okay, good afternoon everybody out there and welcome to our webinar. My name's Chris Francis. I work in the EPA Victoria Communications and Engagement Directorate. Before I start, I just wanted to make a couple of acknowledgements and do excuse me as I read from notes. EPA acknowledges Aboriginal people as the first peoples and traditional custodians of the land and water on which we leave, live, work and depend. We pay respect to Aboriginal elders, past and present. As Victoria's environmental regulator, we pay respect to how country has been protected and cared for by Aboriginal people over many tens of thousands of years. We recognise the unique spiritual and cultural significance of land, water, and all that is in the environment and continuing connection and aspirations for country of Aboriginal people and traditional custodians. Today, I'd also like to acknowledge members of EPA Victoria's board, execu executive leadership team, and our partners at the Department of Land, Water and Planning. Okay, I'd like to remind everyone that today's session is being recorded. The recording slides and relevant links will be made available to all who have registered through Eventbrite. The best way to communicate with our support team is through the Q&A feature. This can be found on the top right hand of the screen in Teams. If you'd like to access the closed captions, a link has been shared in the Q&A announcement feature of Teams. It can also be found on the Eventbrite page and in your reminder email. Thank you all for joining this session on Victoria's new environment protection laws and particularly the proposed final subordinate legislation under the Environment Protection Act. There's been an excellent response to this event. We've had over 3,800 people registered and around 200 odd pre-submitted questions from all over Victoria. And what a beautiful day it is in our state. From industry, community, local government and our state government partners. We found some common themes in the pre-submitted questions and our presenters will respond to some of those during this session. Therefore, we have limited time around 15 minutes for a live Q&A at the end, end of the session. We encourage you to ask questions relating to the content you see today using the Q&A feature available to you. These questions will be moderated and we will cluster the questions into themes so that the most common questions can be answered in the Q&A at the end by our presenters. Presenters will be helped in the back end by a small panel of EPA experts working in the background. So you might just see them look to the side occasionally. This is so we can get the best answers to you. We'll be publishing the questions that come through on topics discussed today into the Q&A feature on Teams. So some of them we'll put, put up and we'll publish. But given the interest in the event, we will only have time to answer a few of the most popular questions. If one of the published questions is something you'd like to know more about, you can always click like to show your interest. We will work through the questions we aren't able to answer today over the coming weeks and we will commit to publishing the most frequently asked questions and answers and putting them on our website, making them publicly, publicly available. So thank you to everyone who's committed to providing us with questions already, over 200, and also for those putting in the, in the questions into the chat today. Um, just a, a note for questions or comments related to issues, current issues that we're dealing with as a regulator. We won't get to those today and I reiterate that the session is about the new laws. So please be mindful of that when submitting your questions. Queries relating to issues need to be triaged through our contact centre on 1300 372 842. Now the information presented in today's webinar is provided as general guidance only. It doesn't constitute legal or professional advice and shouldn't be relied on as a replacement for consulting the laws directly to understand how they might, may apply to you. You should obtain professional advice if you have any specific concerns. Okay, with that all done, to the agenda. First up, we'll have Matt Dabbs, who's our Acting Director, uh, sorry, Acting Executive Director of Regulatory Capability, Engagement and Legal. He'll provide an overview of the Act. We'll then pause for a couple of uh, the pre-submitted questions that you've given and um, which were themed up and answers on the new act itself. Um, we'll then, excuse me, we'll then move 
to the main presentation from our Director of Policy and Regulation, Jackie Stepanoff, who will provide an overview of the proposed final env environment reference standard and environment protection regulations on waste and permissions. Stephen Gapford will then step in. Stephen's our Program Manager for Regulatory Reform. He'll take you through proposed final regulations and standards in relation to on-site wastewater management systems, contaminated environments, litter, air, water, noise, fees, and financial assurances. It'll go back to Jackie. She'll wrap up with the next steps before we go into our substantive, our larger Q&A session, which will include the most asked questions from the duration of the, se the session. And I'll close the meeting showing you where to find more information, links, and how best to stay in touch with us. We'll also provide a survey to all registered attende attendees via Eventbrite after the meeting. Now it's over to Matt Dabbs, who'll take you through a succinct overview of the new laws. Thanks, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your interest in attendance this afternoon. It's uh, fantastic that in these challenging times, technology has given us the opportunity to reach so many of you. As Chris has uh, introduced me, um, I won't uh, reiterate that. Um, current uh, Acting Executive Director of Regulatory Capability, Engagement and Legal. Uh, the primary focus of the session this afternoon is on the subordinate legislation, uh, but ahead of that, I'll be providing a high level overview of the Act itself and the key obligations that it imposes. As we approach 1 July 2021 and the commencement of our new laws, it's worth remembering that this journey started over five years ago. And the key themes of our new Act reflect stakeholder feedback through the inquiry process undertaken in 2015-16. Victorians wanted a more preventative approach to environmental protection, and the cornerstone of this is the introduction of our general environmental duty that we'll talk to. The Act also introduces greater flexibility and proportionality to risk through the GED, and complementary tools in the licensing, permission and registration sphere, contamination and waste. The Act aims to provide clarity and certainty for business by focusing compliance obligations on the preventative actions that can be taken to prevent harm before it occurs. Stakeholders also said they wanted more transparency and the Act introduces a number of reforms to ensure more environmental information is in the public domain to support good environmental decision making and provide access to information about regulatory decisions and the state of the environment. There are also environmental justice initiatives in the Act, access to a greater range of sanctions and innovative approaches to allow for rights of review and participate, participation in decision-making processes. Last but not least, the modernisation of the EPA. There's modernised governance with the introduction of our new statutory board and the modernisation of our tools and powers to align EPA with other regulators. Broadly speaking, the main change coming with the new Act is a focus on preventing harm, whereas the 1970 Act had the focus on the consequence of harm, both from authorised and unauthorised sources. The focus on preventing harm requires us to rethink the way harm arises. This means starting with the source, in particular, the activities that people engage in which create a risk of harm occurring, looking at the chain of events that lead to that harm and cutting off the opportunity for the harm to occur. So take the example shown here in the image. At one end is the harm to a waterway caused by the release of pollution, but moving back up the chain of events that caused the pollution, we can see that there are steps that could have been taken to cut that pathway and prevent the harm. Under the 2017 Act, it's the action you take to prevent the harm that counts towards compliance. The new Act is supported by a framework of laws and policies, many of which you'll hear about today. But I'm starting with the top of the pyramid that you can see, the new Act and the key obligations it imposes. Now, it looks like there is quite a lot on this next slide, but actually much of it many of you will already be familiar, of, familiar with. Firstly, the white boxes on the left represent your current key compliance obligations. On the right, you can see some dark blue and light blue boxes. The dark blue boxes represent what are roughly equivalent obligations that largely replace those in white. The light blue boxes represent some completely new obligations. In summary, this shows you that the pollution offences from the 1970 Act will be replaced by the general environmental duty and supported by new duties to notify EPA of certain pollution incidents, 
and the duty to clean up after an incident if it occurs. The main industrial waste fence has been split into three new waste duties that assign obligations on you depending on whether you generate industrial waste, transport it or receive it. This supply chain framework will allow EPA to target where non-compliance and waste crime arises to support a more preventative approach to waste. What we call prescribed industrial waste will be known as priority waste and will create a number of standing obligations around classifying, isolating and containing such waste, as well as looking at avoiding disposal of such wastes. These duties will be supported by reporting and permitting requirements similar to the current requirements. Finally, the obligations on contaminated land and groundwater have been elevated into the Act as a duty to minimise risk of harm, supported by duties to notify of certain types of contamination. So that is the Act in a nutshell. The cornerstone of the new Act, however, is the General Environmental Duty, or the GED, which is the primary way EPA will achieve prevention of harm. The duty requires you to consider the activities you engage in and understand the risks of harm that those activities create from both pollution and waste perspectives and look at how to eliminate or otherwise reduce those risks so far as is reasonably practical. That is a phrase that will be familiar to many. It's a duty modelled on the OHS DAC Act duties which have been established in Victoria for many decades now. It applies to everyone but carries criminal liability for business and government with penalties up to 1.6 million. Importantly, the duty requires you to minimise risks of harm so far as is reasonably practicable. Understanding what is reasonably practicable to meet your duty is a balancing act. On one hand, you need to consider how significant the risk of harm could be from your activities. On the other hand, you need to consider those risks against the costs of minimising or eliminating them. In finding that balance, you need to consider what you know or reasonably should know about the risks that arise from your activity and how to control those risks. What is available to minimise or eliminate those risks, which may include technology, site practices and many other controls. What is suitable for your circumstances, noting that you may need to check that your risk control measures do not give rise to unforeseen riskier outcomes. As the risk of harm increases, or is that there is greater knowledge of options that are suitable and available to reduce the risks, then the amount of effort you are expected to allocate to managing risk increases, meaning that you ensure a proportionate response. What is known about the risk of harm and controls that are available and suitable is known as the state of knowledge. Knowledge on the risks of harm and how to minimise them is crucial to you meeting your duties, and it's something that evolves over time. Compliance information can come from a range of sources, including business and industry generally, EPA and other regulators, and independent organisations like universities and industry associations. EPA has already published a range of guidance material to help you understand your obligations and how to achieve compliance to a standard that EPA expects. Other knowledge sources from business and industry, documents showing you how to perform activities safely, manuals, safety data, instructions and labels, training on equipment use, and guidance from industry bodies. Although the GED represents the cornerstone of the new Act and the main way of preventing harm, licensing remains an important part of the legislation. The one size fits all approach to EPA licensing, however, will be replaced by three tiers of EPA permissions. Registrations, which can be easily granted and are suited to low risk activities. Permits, which will have standardised assessment processes and are suited to moderate risk activities with low complexity. Finally, licences to apply customised conditions to manage those complex activities that need the highest level of regulatory control to manage their significant risks. Licences will continue to be required to construct certain plant or equipment or in the development and modification of processes or systems, development licence. They will also continue to be required to research development and demonstration activities, e.g. pilot project licences. Licences will be subject to reviews at least every five years and will no longer be granted indefinitely. There is already a wide suite of information on the new Act available at our website, epa.vic.gov.au backslash new laws. Our prevention focused guidance contributes to the state of knowledge and includes self assessment tools for business to help you check what actions you can take to manage risk. 
industry or sector guidance. This covers common industry specific hazards and risks and topic specific guidance. It also includes a four step risk management process and information on the duties framework at the core of the act. Hazard based guidance. This covers dust, erosion and sediment, liquid storage and handling, noise, odour, solid storage and handling. General guidance, for example, how to manage your environmental risk and working with an environmental co consultant and guidance on what the EPA will consider it to be reasonably practical, practicable. We've also been working with industry partners to, to develop a small business program pilot and an industry partnership program. These will roll out over coming months ahead of the new Act's commencement and relevant links will be provided as part of our post event package for all re registered attendees. So that's the overview of the new Act to uh, introduce the subordinate legislation. I'm just going to touch on a couple of the questions that have been pre-submitted before handing over to Jackie to talk about the uh, subordinate legislation. So one of the key questions uh, that has come through, um, both independent of, uh, of this process, um, but just through stakeholder engagement more broadly, uh, essentially, will the new laws ensure that EPA takes a stronger stance on polluting companies and entities? Uh, EPA has progressively strengthened its stance against polluters over recent years and will continue to do so, very much enabled by the new legislation. As I've spoken to earlier, the new laws will enable us to intervene earlier and hold duty holders to account for the establishment of all reasonably practical controls to reduce or eliminate risk to human health and the environment. Unfortunately, some operators flout the law and the consequences are all too familiar. So in those circumstances, we will take a no tolerance approach to non-compliance and the new laws bolster our toolkit considerably. Uh, the second question that's uh, come through um, uh, from a thematic perspective relates to the enforcement of the GED and its relationship to past standards. E.g. will past EPA publications, e.g. 480 and 960, that include specific target standards remain within the state of knowledge and be enforceable. As we've already spoken to, the state of knowledge is core to the GED, but involves, it evolves over time. For day one, existing EPA guidance that identifies risks of harm associated with activities and the way to minimise those risks will provide a good way to understand what your compliance obligations are. EPA has already released a wide range of guidance, as I've spoken to. Um, however, over time, that will lose its, currently, uh, lose its currency. So progressively, uh, duty holders will need to continue to inform themselves of what the state of knowledge is within their given industries. For example, in the case of publications 480 and 960, they were published in 1994 and 2004 respectively. They've recently been replaced by a new guide on civil construction, 1834, which replaces both 480 and 960. This is a good example of how standards and compliance obligations will evolve as the state of knowledge increases in relation to given risks. So those are the two questions uh, that are part of my segment uh, this afternoon. Um, I will hand over now to Jackie Stepanoff, Director of Policy and Regulation, to speak to this proposed subordinate legislation under the new Environment Protection Act. Over to you, Jackie. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jackie Stepanoff, and as Matt mentioned, I'm Director of Policy and Regulation at EPA Victoria. Uh, in partnership with the Department of Environment, Water, Land and Planning, my area led the development of the subordinate legislation that we're discussing today. Before I go on, I'd just like to acknowledge that partnership and my colleagues from the department who are here with us today. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about the proposed subordinate legislation that will support Victoria's new environment protection laws. I just wanna say before I get started, I'm reading from notes. Um, I'm reading from notes because it's really important to me that I give you the best quality information today and I'm conscious this is going to be recorded and used for others as well. Um, so please bear with me if I glance down uh, and up a little bit. Today we'll talk briefly about where the subordinate legislation fits within the new environment protection laws. The process that we went through in developing the subordinate legislation including public consultation and then we'll talk through the proposed environment reference standard, its objectives and intent, and the proposed environment protection regulations. As I talk through the presentation, you'll hear me use the term duty holder. For today's purpose, this term 
should be taken to include a reference to any person, business or undertaking that has an obligation under the new environment protection laws, as those persons will have a duty to comply with the new laws. OK, we'll begin with a short recap of the new environment protection laws, building on what Matt's just shared, and we'll discuss our approach to developing the proposed regulations and standards. So we saw this slide earlier when Matt discussed the new Environment Protection Act. As you can see with the red circle, development of a range of subordinate legislation is permitted under the new Act. Today we're focusing mostly on the proposed environment protection regulations, which build on the Act by setting out how to fulfil duties and obligations, and also sets out particular processes that support the Act. We'll also discuss the Environment Reference Standard, which is a new instrument that articulates community expectations about the state of the environment. And we'll discuss briefly determinations and designations in relation to waste permissions and contaminated environments. In developing the proposed subordinate legislation, we were guided by the following principles. Firstly, the general environmental duty. The general environmental duty and supporting duties under the new Act should be the primary controls used to manage risks of harm to human health and the environment. Any additional regulations or subordinate instruments should not impede the GED, nor create unnecessary prescription. That's an important principle. Proportionality, the proposed subordinate legislation should be proportionate to the risk of harm to the environment and human health that it seeks to address. Uh, regulatory burden where possible and appropriate, the subordinate legislation should maintain or reduce regulatory burden in Victoria. Flexibility, where possible, duty holders will be provided with flexibility regarding how they comply with their obligations. Uh, consistency and predictability, the subordinate legislation in particular regulations should be consistent with other policies and laws to avoid confusion, and they should be predictable to create a stable regulatory environment and foster confidence. And finally, enforceability. Subordinate legislation should only be made where it's capable of being enforced. Exposure drafts of the subordinate legislation, which is the Environment Protection Regulations, their incorporated documents and the Environment Reference Standard, were released for public comment in September 2019 for a period of 60 days. During the public comment period, we received 317 submissions, which raised more than 2,200 issues for consideration. The issues that were raised largely focused on waste, land and contaminated environments, noise and on-site wastewater management systems. While most submissions were from metropolitan areas, regional Victoria was well represented and accounted for a quarter of all submissions. The majority of submissions were from individuals and business owners. Around a third of the issues raised related to concerns that the proposed regulations wouldn't sufficiently protect human health or the environment, often seeking to strengthen or tighten the regulations or standards, and around 20% raised concerns regarding the costs to be incurred from complying with the regulations. These tended to seek relaxation of standards or narrower coverage of the regulations. Around a quarter of the issues raised resulted in a recommendation to the Minister for substantive change to the proposed regulations and ERS. This was largely because more than half of all the issues raised actually didn't relate to the design of the regulatory framework, they related more to requests for guidance, further information, or they offered comment on how EPA should implement the new framework. Any new or amended regulatory proposals emerging from the consultation were assessed against good practice principles to ensure the subordinate legislation proportionately addressed the risk of harm to human health and the environment wherever possible and minimise regulatory burden. In the normal course of events, following consultation, final regulations and standards would simply have been made as legislation. However, given the deferral of the commencement of the new Act to 2021, the Victorian Government has taken the innovative step of releasing proposed final versions of the Environment Protection Regulations and Environment Reference Standard to support duty holder and peer regulator readiness for the commencement of our new environment protection legislation. These proposed final regulations and ERS are now available on EPA's website together with the final response to public comment report, which summarises the government's response to the key issues raised during the public comment period. Uh, that report summarises the key changes made and explains why other changes have not been made. We're not seeking further feedback on the proposed final regulations as they represent the endorsed position of the Victorian government. This release 
of the proposed final is an important milestone that will provide you with more time to become familiar with the detail of the new subordinate legislation and prepare for the commencement of the new environment protection legislation in July 2021. Okay, I'm now going to dive into a bit of detail and I'm going to start with an overview of the instrument that you may be the most unfamiliar with, the proposed environment reference standard. So the ERS is a new instrument under the new Act. The 2016 inquiry into the EPA found that the state environment protection policies or SEPs as you might call them under the 1970 Act were in many instances unclear and difficult for decision makers to apply. It also found that they were difficult to update in line with evolving scientific and technical understanding. The inquiry recommended phasing out SEPs and waste management policies with their component parts to be split into new fit for purpose instruments. One of these instruments is the ERS. In the new framework, the ERS is a reference tool that is used to assess and report on environmental conditions in Australia. Importantly, the ERS is not a compliance standard. I always think the trick is in the name, this environment reference standard, it's there for reference purposes. This means it does not create any obligations on duty holders and it does not define fixed environmental standards to be enforced. But it does have a role in decision making as the Act requires that it either must or may be considered when making some decisions, for example, certain ministerial decisions in EPA's assessment of applications for development, operating and pilot project licenses and in the assessment of planning permit applications where appropriate. The ERS is made up of environmental values, which are the things in the environment Victorians care about and want to protect. For example, water that's safe for swimming. It also has indicators and objectives for measuring whether these environmental values are being achieved or maintained. It also, it has environmental values, indicators and objectives for ambient air, water, ambient sound and land environments. For ambient air, the proposed ERS contains standards transposed from SEP ambient air quality. It also contains a new qualitative objective for odour, which is a significant issue of community concern. For ambient sound, the proposed ERS transposes the majority of beneficial uses from SEP N1 and SEP N2, and it introduces some new environmental values for child learning and development and human tranquility and enjoyment in natural areas. For land, the proposed ERS contains standards from SEP Prevention and Management of Contaminated Land with some updates to improve clarity. And for water, the proposed ERS contains standards from the recently reviewed SEP waters with only minor changes. Due to the tight timeframes in which the proposed ERS was developed, we did not undertake an extensive review of new scientific evidence. Apart from ambient sound standards, most of the indicators and objectives have been chosen from amongst existing standards. A more thorough review and gap analysis relating to standards may form part of EPA's future strategy for the ERS. We made some key changes to the ERS in response to public comment, recognising traditional owners in the ERS preamble, changing the name of the noise standards to the ambient sound standards to better reflect the aspects of the environment that are the subject for standards, adding another new environmental value called musical entertainment to the ambient sound standards to recognise community demand for musical entertainment and a current policy objective under the SEPs, clarifying that environmental values for water do not apply to water and constructed landfill cells, removing any ambiguity of intent. Okay, I'll now provide a summary of the proposed regulations for some specific subject areas. Firstly, I'll talk about the proposed waste regulations. Uh, acknowledging that Matt's already given us an introduction to the new Act, uh, I do just want to quickly touch on the new Act and how, what it covers of relevance to the regs here. The waste duties under the new Act cover the unique risks and complexities of waste as it moves through the waste management chain. The duties apply to people who generate, transport or receive industrial waste. These duties are called the industrial waste and priority waste duties. Okay, to the regulations. To support the new Act, the proposed waste regulations create a framework on how to comply with the duties set out under the Act. Together, the waste duties and the proposed regulations are intended to manage risks to human health and the environment and to support and encourage waste reuse and resource recovery. 
The proposed regulations replace the current and inflexible prescribed industrial waste controls with obligations that will be tailored to the hazard and the potential for mismanagement of specific wastes. They will resolve grey areas in the current regulations by taking a comprehensive no gaps approach, ensuring that clear regulatory obligations exist for all waste management activities. The proposed regulations support compliance with the industrial waste duties through a three-step process, and you can see that on the slide in front of you. Firstly, classification. Industrial waste must be properly identified and classified so it's clear what duties apply to the waste and how it must be managed. Secondly, transportation. Industrial waste must be safely contained during transportation and some waste types have further containment and isolation requirements. Some wastes also have a trans transaction control where every time they change hands, EPA must be informed. EPA is developing a new electronic waste tracker tool to support this duty. I should just do a quick bit of cross promotion here to say that you can find out more about EPA's new waste tracking system at another upcoming webinar on the 23rd of February. And I think registration is available through our website. And thirdly, lawful place. Industrial waste must only go somewhere with lawful authority to receive it. I'm just going to dig into each of those three now for a little while. Under the new Act, the definitions of waste and industrial waste are taken to mean any waste arising from commercial, industrial or trade activities or from laboratories. Some industrial waste will be prescribed as priority uh, and or pro reportable priority wastes. These will have specific duties attached to them, which allow additional management and transportation controls to be applied, depending on the classification as either an industrial priority or a portable priority waste, there are less or more obligations to control the risk of harm. For example, you'll see on the slide here that for a portable priority wastes, you'll have the same obligations as those applying to industrial and priority waste, as well as some additional obligations like the waste tracking I mentioned earlier. Just looking at each classification in more detail, industrial waste. Industrial waste is the broad category covering all waste. This includes household waste once it is gathered at a waste facility, such as a transfer station or a landfill. Some example industrial waste types are inert construction and demolition waste, commingled recycling, and as I said, municipal waste once it's been collected. Next up, priority waste is industrial waste which carries additional requirements due to its typically hazardous properties or because it's prone to mismanagement or in some cases for facilitating waste reduction and resource recovery. The Act outlines additional duties and requirements for managing these kinds of waste and some examples are processed food waste, e-waste, liquid organic waste, biosolids, shredder flock and tyres. And reportable priority waste. It's a subset of priority waste and it carries the highest level of requirements. It's reserved for waste types with the highest hazard levels or capacity for mismanagement. Controls for these wastes, including restricting transportation to permitted vehicles and mandatory reporting to EPA each time the waste changes hands. Example waste types here are pesticides, solvents, asbestos and grease trap wastes. The new framework also aligns with other regulations. Reportable priority waste generally includes substances that are also covered by dangerous goods legislation and priority waste includes some waste that are classified as hazardous substances. The new streamlined classification system introduces, uh, I think quite helpfully, pre-classified lists of common waste types and hazards, leaving a much smaller group of wastes that will require sampling and analysis. We ho we're hopeful that this will create um, a much more efficient environment. Waste will be identified by a system of interjurisdictionally used waste codes. This is intended to lessen waste misclassification and reduce the compliance burden on industry. Uh, also, the system will also introduce mirror waste codes to cover some waste types like drilling muds that, that are hazardous only when they're contaminated, but might also present in an uncontaminated form. Again, just trying to make some changes to align with hazard. Okay, I'll just briefly talk through the proposed streamlined classification system for contaminated soils, which produces, which proposes to introduce, um, first of all, and importantly, uh, for those of you interested in this aspect of the regs, an incorporated document, waste disposal categories, characteristics and thresholds. That incorporated document sets out waste disposal categories, category A, B, C or D, as the slide shows. The regulations also introduce a new category D for low level contaminated soils, a new category of asbestos contaminated only soil, 
and a requirement for generators and receivers of fill material soils below category D there on the slide to hold a declaration of use. Sorry, soil must be categorised as either A, B, C or D, soil containing asbestos only or fill material. Categories A, B and C are similar to the existing categories in the current prescribed industrial waste framework. Category D, as I said, is new. It's intended to support limited containment options within infrastructure projects and safely divert these materials from hazardous waste landfills. Category D would cover contaminated soils within the lower half of the current category C soils, but still sits above the threshold for fill material. Uh, soil containing asbestos only, uh, this is as it sounds, soil where the only contaminant is asbestos. It cannot be used for limited containment like category D, but it does not have to go to a category C landfill and it, it can go to a landfill permitted to accept asbestos. Asbestos contaminated soil only attracts a $30 levy, which is why it has one of the reasons it has its own category here. And fill material, which is soil, which is safe for direct application to land. Lawful place. The Act requires that industrial waste may only be received somewhere that has lawful authority to receive it. This is known as lawful place. The proposed regulations set out the ways of meeting lawful place according to risks of managing specific sites. There are several ways a receiver can meet the lawful place requirement. They are through permissions, permission exemptions, emergency authorizations, determinations, uh, and declarations of use for lower hazard industrial wastes. I'll just step out a little more detail on these mechanisms across the next section of my presentation. Let's start with the mechanism suited to your lowest risk. The proposed regulations set out the requirements for a declaration of use or a DOU, which enables industry to meet lawful place requirements without needing a permission. A DOU is an agreement uh, for how a specific industrial waste or waste derived material can be directly used. It describes the waste, it assesses its risk and it identifies legitimate uses. The DOU will enable industry to meet the lawful place duty without the need to apply for permission, manage their risks of harms easily and it encourages information sharing in the waste reuse and recovery market. There are two kinds of DOU available under the proposed regulations. The first one is an industry set DOU where it's a declaration made by the generator or the producer of materials. Um, this is a self-assessed agreement between a producer and a receiver for low-risk wastes. It supports innovation by not requiring EPA to set a standard. It leverages the DED by setting a state of knowledge relating to any latent harms and describing handling requirements. It can be made for a wide range of uses. Uh, it must address the properties and risks associated with using the material. Importantly, it's self-declared and it must be accepted by the receiver as fit for use and it's fully flexible to individual situations and we hope supportive of innovation in resource recovery. The second kind of DOU is an EPA set standards EOU. That's where EPA might decide to issue a DOU. It's an agreement where EPA specifies through a determination how to manage certain kinds of low risk marginal wastes. It only requires the generator or the producer to declare against the published declaration. It ensures that the use of waste is fit for purpose and it provides an easy way to declare a waste fit for use. We think they're most useful where there is a known state of knowledge and limited alternatives such as manures. Um, we made some key changes to the proposed final regulations in response to public comment. Some new information received uh, through the consultation provided a better understanding of current industry practices and identified some opportunities to improve the DOU tool and better support a circular economy. The changes that uh, have arisen from that consultation include reducing the amount of information required of waste producers and providers in a DOU, just re requiring now only enough information to enable consent, removing the 60 day limit for temporary storage of fill material under a DOU and clarifying that fill material generated and reused within the same cadastral boundary does not need a DOU and use determinations in some instances to address situations rather than a DOU. And I'll discuss determinations on my next slide which is here. Consultation on the waste regulations also triggered the development of a small suite of other instruments called determinations and designations, which we considered were the best way to address issues raised. Submissions from across industry, including composting, agriculture, construction and development supported the general intent of the DOU to allow industry to have more control over its own regulatory arrangements. 
but some submissions suggested that the burden of completing a DOU would increase administrative load and place some operational constraints on businesses seeking to use waste for other purposes. Most importantly, whether those materials were common, used regularly, and with a high volume of transaction with a large range of parties. So an example might be aggregates. In those cases, submissions recommended that there should be just set standards issued by EPA to avoid the need for drawing up new paperwork and exchanging it, uh, and that those who generate and use their own waste on site should not require a DOU. So as a result of that feedback, EPA did some further analysis and identified several common low risk waste types for which a determination could be developed as an alternative legal pathway for waste to leave the framework instead of a DOU. So what's a determination? Determinations are instruments made by the EPA. I think of them as sitting under the regs. Um, they set required specifications for the lawful deposit, transport and receipt of industrial waste subject to conditions or limitations. This means that the person, place or premises will be authorised to receive the specified industrial waste, ensuring the waste duties are met by all parties along the waste supply chain. Unlike a DOU, a determination will allow waste to be deposited and received without the need for a written declaration, providing the specifications of the determination are met, so it will set conditions. EPA is developing a range of waste related determinations. Examples are determinations to allow the lawful receipt and storage of reportable priority waste at council transfer stations, Determination to set out minimum standards or specifications for processed organic waste, including testing and sampling requirements and quality of output to support unrestricted reuse. And a determination to allow for the use and management of aggregate material in an unrestricted manner. As part of the government's Recycling Markets Acceleration Program, EPA will be consulting on four of the proposed determinations through Engage Victoria, and it's my understanding a discussion paper that gives you a lot more detail on this topic will be available within the next week on Engage Vic, so keep your eyes out if you're interested in this area. Designations, they're a legal instrument that allow the reclassification of waste types. They enable EPA to classify a waste, for example, category A, B, C or D, or to address the mixing, blending or diluting of waste. They also allow EPA to specify how that waste must be transported, received and disposed of. Some of you may have been involved with waste classifications under the current system. It's fair to think of designations as being the inheritor of that. EPA is developing some designations, for example, to make lawful the commercial transport of reportable priority waste as part of the ChemClear product stewardship scheme and the Return Unwanted Medicines program. We'll leave waste now. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the new permissioning framework. Okay, so picking up from where Matt left off, as you would have seen, the new Act introduces a three-tiered permissions framework of licenses, permits and registration. And as Matt said, this is a change from the current permissions framework, which only includes licenses. The proposed regulations assign prescribed activities to their appropriate tier in the permissions framework based on the level of risk that they pose, their complexity and their need for greater oversight. And you can find this detail in Schedule 1 of the regulations, um, which I think is uh, an, an important resource for those of you who are interested as to how various businesses might fit into the framework. Several key principles informed our proposed permissions cohort for day one. When I say day one, uh, I'm referring to the commencement of the EP Act. Firstly, minimising unnecessary change and disruption for permission holders, both new and existing, in transitioning to the new framework. If your activity requires a licence under the current framework, then it will almost certainly require a licence under the new framework. Ensuring coverage of existing permissioned activities before seeking to expand to new activities. Giving the GED time to demonstrate its effectiveness, remembering those principles we used uh, in drafting the subordinate legislation. Using permissions, especially low cost and low burden tools like registrations to provide lawful place for small waste businesses. I'll just go through each tier briefly. Licenses will continue to be reserved for the highest risk and complexity activities, which require customised EPA assessments and unique conditions. Those activities that are currently subject to a licence under the existing framework will transition directly across to new licences under the new proposed regulations. In addition, a new licence activity has been added for large waste and resource recovery facilities in recognition of the significant stockpile and fire risk posed by large sites where combustible recyclable waste is inappropriately stored. Permits are targeted at moderate risk activities or activities which are high risk but low complexity. 
These are lower cost and lower burden tools compared to licenses with the application of mostly standardized conditions. The day one permit tier will be used to consolidate many existing other approvals and exemptions from other parts of the current framework where EPA assessment is still required. For example, industrial waste resource guidelines, approvals and instruments included in SEPs. Um, a very a small number of new activities will also be included in the permit tier, including medium sized waste and resource recovery activities. And then to registrations, registrations are simple, automatically generated permissions. Just want to pause on that. They're automatically generated, targeted to the lowest risk activities within the framework. They have standardized conditions across activity types. The primary function of registrations in the day one regulations will be to provide a mechanism for the lawful receipt of waste for smaller waste businesses. Registrations will also apply to some other new activities such as dry cleaning um, as some rehoused and including some rehoused existing approvals and exemptions such as waste transports and temporary asbestos storage. Uh, the proposed final regulations set out some transitional provisions for duty holders who need to apply for new permissions. So for large to medium waste and resource recovery facilities activities, there'll be a three month period in which to apply for a license or permit. And for all other new activities, there'll be a six month period to apply for a required permit or registration. Uh, we made a few changes in response to public feedback as well in this area. We broadened the definition of project site in relation to the permit category for containment of category D waste soil on site. This responded to the issue raised by industry that the definition was too restrictive for large scale public infrastructure projects where a project covered multiple parcels of land. We removed the proposed permit requirement for liquid organic waste. This will instead be managed by determination or declaration of use. And we've added a new registration activity for waste acid sulfate soils for treatment or amelioration. I mentioned determinations earlier as another instrument available under the new framework. Um, the new act allows EPA to create a kind of a let out for permissions in specific circumstances where the burden associated with the permission has been to, deemed to be disproportionate to the risk. These determinations include requirements which a duty holder must be able to meet to be eligible. A small number of these are planned to work alongside the regulations at day one. If a duty holder complies with the requirements of a determination, they may not have to hold a permission or they may hold a lesser permission. Um, we're developing a few of these, including, for example, a determination setting out where specific modification works to sewage treatment plants operated by water corporations do not trigger a development license requirement um, and mostly smaller works to improve environmental performance or emergency preparedness are covered there. Some existing general exemptions have been moved from the regulations to determinations where appropriate, including exemptions for smaller discharges to atmosphere, which can meet the requirements set out in the determination. At this point, um, I believe I'm handing over to Stephen Gatford um, to pick up from me to go forward on with the rest of the presentation. Um, I think what we might do with questions, if that's okay, is we'll wait to the end and capture them all together, um, just so we make sure we make a maximum amount of time for questions. So we could move on to Stephen's presentation. That'd be fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Jackie, and hi, everyone. Um, as Jackie mentioned, I'm going to cover some other key aspects of the proposed final subordinate legislation, starting with on-site wastewater management systems. And this includes septic tank systems. Under the proposed final regulations, councils will continue to administer permits for the construction, installation or alteration of an on-site wastewater management system with a capacity of up to 5,000 litres on any day. The regulations provide criteria for councils to consider when assessing permit applications. They also set out the circumstances when a permit must be refused. Councils will be able to take enforcement action for failure to obtain one of these permits or for breach of the permit conditions. In response to public comment, the proposed final regulations now include new requirements for persons in management or control of land with an on-site wastewater management system. These requirements, which are in part 5.7 of the regulations, will apply to all operating systems including legacy systems that did not require a permit 
under the Environment, Environment Protection Act when they were put in. The requirements in the proposed final regulations include an obligation to take reasonable steps to maintain the system in good working order, a duty to keep maintenance records, a requirement to respond to problems, and from mid-2022, a requirement to notify local government of a system failure and what's being done to fix it. Local government officers will, in some situations, be able to order a person to undertake maintenance. There are offences in the regulations for failure to meet these requirements, which local governments will be able to enforce. Several other changes have been made in response to public comment. The fees in the final regulations relating to these permits reflect new data provided by local government and will better provide for cost recovery. Councils will also be able to reduce or waive a fee if they consider it reasonable to do so. The regulations have also been changed so that local government will no longer be required to submit annual returns to EPA. Now let's look at the proposed environment protection regulations relating to contaminated environments. But we'll start by recapping the duties that are in the Act. This slide shows how the contaminated land framework is structured across the Act and the regulations. Reforms to the framework will put the onus on those in management or control of contaminated land to ensure the risks posed by the contamination are appropriately managed. The Act as shown on the slide, introduces two duties for contaminated land that may apply where concentrations of a waste or chemical substance are above background level and they create a risk of harm to human health or the environment. Firstly, the duty to manage contaminated land, which is section 39. It establishes a risk-based proportionate obligation on those in management or control of contaminated land to manage its risks. And secondly, the duty to notify at section 40. It will require those in management or control of contaminated land to notify EPA of the contamination in various circumstances. Both of these duties apply to existing contaminated sites. The Act at section 36 defines background level. It is either a level specified in or determined under the regulations or the environment reference standard or the naturally occurring level of contaminants, which can vary across different parts of Victoria. By working out the background level, duty holders will be able to establish if the duty to manage and the duty to notify apply. The Act also introduces a new environmental management, environmental audit system that allows for a scaled rather than one size fits all audit. This will be supported by a quicker and lower cost land contamination assessment called the preliminary risk screen assessment. The Act also introduces site management orders and better environment plans, which will be able to support ongoing longer term management and compliance in relation to contaminated land. The regulations support and clarify the two duties that are in the Act, the duty to manage and the duty to notify. They set out how to comply with the duty to manage, specifically in relation to non-aqueous phase liquids or NAPL as shown on screen there. More on the regulations now. The regulations enable EPA to make a determination that sets out how to establish what's called an alternative background level of contamination. This process acknowledges that background levels of waste and chemical substances vary across the state. And in some cases, a process is appropriate to determine an alternative background level where the concentration of the waste or chemical substance is below this level, the duty to manage and the duty to notify will not apply. The regulations 
also support and clarify the contaminated land duties in the Act by prescribing circumstances that are notifiable contamination. They also prescribe circumstances that are exempt from the duty to notify. And the key examples here are where a site is already subject to a relevant EPA notice, or in some circumstances where a certificate or statement of environmental audit has been issued. The regulations also set out additional matters which must be included when notifying EPA of contamination. And as mentioned before, the regulations set out cleanup obligations under the duty to manage where a non-aqueous phase liquid is present in soil or groundwater. So overall, the regulations provide boundaries around the duty to manage and the duty to notify. And just to highlight one change that you will see in the proposed final regulations relating to the duty to notify. Submissions on the initial draft regulations argued that the notification requirements were not always risk-based. And after considering feedback, the notification requirements for groundwater contamination have been changed to limit notification to when the groundwater may be used for specific activities, such as drinking, stock watering, or irrigation, or where it discharges to surface water. That's at Regulation 10. Moving on to the proposed contaminated land determination. As mentioned, the regulations enable EPA to make a determination that specifies a background level or a process for deriving a background level for a chemical substance or waste. And where this is done, it displaces the application of the naturally occurring concentration. Such a determination can be general or specific and can apply in a single location or several locations. EPA is currently developing such a determination. It will set out a method for determining background levels where ambient contamination is present. EPA will be seeking, seeking feedback on this proposed methodology for deriving background level concentrations. A, cons a consultation paper will be published on Engage Vic later this month with comments sought on it this month and next. We'll now briefly look at the proposed final litter regulations. So the litter offences in the current 1970 Act that were not included in the new Environment Protection Act are instead included in the proposed final regulations, but in a more streamlined and modernised manner. These offences will be enforceable by EPA and by other litter enforcement agencies, including local councils, Victoria Police and Parks Victoria. Following public consultation, a minor change was made to the regulation relating to litter from a moving vehicle. This offence now won't apply where a person has been instructed to move the vehicle by an emergency services officer. We'll now have a look at the proposed air framework. The proposed air regulations, which are in part 5.2, will not significantly alter the obligations of duty holders. Instead, they mainly aim to provide certainty on how to meet the general environmental duty for specific types of risks to human health and the environment. So the proposed final regulations relating to air cover class three substances, solid fuel heaters, ozone depleting substances, vehicle emissions, and national pollutant inventory requirements. Finally, a reminder that as we discussed earlier, the proposed environment reference standard contains reference standards transposed from SEP ambient air quality. And it also includes a new qualitative objective for ODA. Moving on to the water regulations. The core elements of the water framework largely reflect the policy positions of SEP waters, which was made in late 2018. So starting with the Act, the general environmental duty and other powers under the Environment Protection Act will address a significant portion of the risks of harm relating to water. The proposed regulations about water, which are in part 5.4, cover 
the discharge of waste from vessels, special water supply catchments, the cleanup of non-aqueous phase liquids, and the discharge or deposit of waste to an aquifer, which will require an EPA permit and only be allowed in specific circumstances. The proposed transitional regulations will save some clauses of SEP waters for two years from commencement of the new framework. During this time, EPA and the D Department of Environment will engage with relevant stakeholders on how these clauses should transition into the new framework. Finally, as a reminder, the ERS, Environment Reference Standard discussed earlier, contains environmental quality indicators and objectives that were in SEP waters with some minor changes. The noise framework. The core elements in the new noise framework are the new act, the noise regulations, the noise protocol, and the environment reference standard. The introduction of the general environmental duty will change the focus of compliance and enforcement by allowing the consideration of risks from any noise source, not just those that are specifically regulated. The Act also now allows any source of noise to be assessed as unreasonable. So while the general environmental duty requires the risks of harm from noise to be minimised as far as reasonably practicable, a residual risk of unreasonable noise can still remain. And because of this, a significant amount of regulation will be in place to support the assessment of unreasonable noise or aggravated noise. Looking at the regulations, they largely mirror the requirements of SEP N1 and N2. They provide a framework for defining unreasonable noise and aggravated noise. And we'll cover that in more detail shortly. The noise protocol supports the regulations and will be incorporated into the regulations. It contains the mandatory method for assessing and measuring noise in relation to commercial, industrial and trade premises and entertainment venues. And there's the ERS. As mentioned previously, the beneficial uses in the SEPs have been repurposed to provide the basis for ambient sound reference standards in the environment reference standard along with newly developed indicators and objectives. And this is the first vict for Victoria. They describe the ambient sound environment that supports desirable outcomes, such as sleep in the night and child learning and development for a range of different land use settings. This includes highly urbanized, suburban and rural areas, as well as natural environments where ambient noise can affect the environment's restorative value on human health. Now for some more details on the regulations about noise, which are in part 5.3. For residential premises, the proposed regulations will, as with the current residential noise regulations, deem noise from specific items at prohibited times to be unreasonable noise. If it can be heard, in a habitable room of another residential premises. So for example, a lawnmower before 9 a.m. on a weekend. They also prescribe when noise from a res residential premises may be aggravated noise. The regulations also clarify that noise from a residential premises can be unreasonable, whether or not the item is prescribed or noise occurs outside prohibited times which is consistent with the current 1970 Act. For commercial, industrial and trade premises, the proposed regulations set out how noise is determined to be unreasonable or aggravated. They also set out new noise sensitive areas for the purpose of setting noise limits. And these are child care centres, kindergartens, primary and secondary schools, as well as tourist establishments, caravan parks, and camping grounds in defined rural areas only. The regulations also define the level of noise at which noise is deemed to be aggravated. They set a 55 decibel limit on noise from industrial, trade, and commercial premises at night in Victoria. 
They include frequency spectrum as a specific factor in determining where the noise is unreasonable. And they include obligations for regional Victoria that were previously housing guidance. The regulations also align the boundary for application of noise controls with the urban growth boundary identified in planning schemes. They make the Saturday evening period the same as for Monday to Friday when calculating noise limits. There will still be a mechanism to allow for exemptions from the applications of noise limits and the measurement methodologies, how limits are calculated for major urban and rural areas will remain the same. So the regulations cover a lot. In response to public comments, two key changes have been made to the noise regulations relating to noise sensitive areas. The obligation to not exceed noise limits for childcare centres, kindergartens, primary and secondary schools will only apply when those sites are operating, that is during their normal operating hours. And in relation to included rural areas, these will not be noise sensitive areas when an outdoor event or venue is in operation. Finally on noise, noise from wind energy facilities. EPA will have a central role in the regulation of wind farm noise as it relates to the Environment Protection Act. The general environmental duty will place a positive obligation on operators of wind energy facilities to demonstrate compliance. The unreasonable noise provisions will also apply to noise from these facilities. Proposed regulations and a regulatory impact statement relating to noise from wind energy facilities are now available on the Engage Vic website for public comment until the 28th of February. Turning to fees, prescribed fees are set out in the regulations in Chapter 8. The fee rates were developed where appropriate using the principle of cost recovery as required by the Victorian Government's Treasury guidelines. Compared to current fees, some fees will remain unchanged while others will increase or decrease. There are also some new fees for existing types of EPA assessments. So for example, assessing an application for a development license exemption and for EPA assessments relating to new instruments in the new act. So for example, for assessing a proposed better environment plan. There are a couple of other key changes to note. Firstly, some fees are variable and will require EPA to track how many hours its assessment takes. And secondly, there will no longer be an annual fee discount for accredited license holders. In response to public consultation, a small number of fees were adjusted to better reflect cost recovery, but no major changes have been made to EPA fees compared to the first exposure draft of the regulations. We'll now talk through financial assurances. Financial assurances are required in different situations so that if a cleanup is required, appropriate funds are available. Under the new Act and regulations, there are some key changes to the financial assurance regime. Under the new Act, a financial assurance may be required by EPA as a condition of an environmental action notice or a site management order. In relation to permissions, under the current framework, the current regulations, the scheduled premises regulations, state that a financial assurance must be provided by all operators of certain types of scheduled premises. Under the new framework, there's a more flexible approach. The new regulations set out the permission activities where a financial assurance may be required. There will be an additional case by case assessment by EPA to determine whether a financial assurance is required given the specifics of each applicant's situation. The proposed final regulations set out prescribed risk assessment criteria, which EPA must take into account when performing this case-by-case -case assessment. Each application to conduct the prescribed permission activity will be assessed against these criteria to determine if a financial assurance is required. 
Under the new regulations, large and medium scale waste and resource recovery facilities will newly require an EPA license or permit. And operators of these facilities may also require a financial assurance as a condition of their license or permit. EPA has recently been consulting with the sector on the proposed method for calculating financial assurances for waste and resource recovery facilities. And EPA is now considering the comments we've received and will respond to the matters raised. EPA's method for calculating financial assurance amounts will be published in the Victorian Government Gazette in June. Now it's back to Jackie. Thanks, Stephen. So next steps. What happens now? The proposed final regulations and the ERS need to be formally made into law by the Governor and Council, which will happen once the EP Act is proclaimed to commence. As I mentioned earlier, the proposed final regulations and ERS are available on EPA's website and are there to support duty holder and peer regulator readiness for the commencement of our new environment protection legislation. The proposed final versions incorporate changes made in response to feedback from consultation. And you saw across the slides, little breakout boxes and speaking bubbles that indicated some highlights of where changes were made to respond to issues raised. Uh, at this stage, um, just to reiterate the message we began with, government's not seeking further feedback on the proposed final legislation as they represent the endorsed position of the Victorian government. As we've mentioned throughout this presentation, EPA is progressing work on determinations and designations which pick up some of the issues raised in consultation or just are simply designed to complement the regulations and standards. And there are opportunities for community and industry to engage on the development of these legislative instruments. We will continue to work through the EPA industry reference groups to keep everyone updated and involved with this process. We're also continuing to deliver our major work program of communication and education material that will clarify legislative and regulatory requirements, including on the subordinate legislation. Our engagement is focused on working with stakeholders to prepare for 1 July 2021 and ensure that there is readiness to operate under the new legislation. Now, we're now going to answer some questions that were submitted to us through the event registration process and a big thanks to all of you um, that popped your questions in in advance. It gave us the opportunity to put our heads around them and also gave the team some time to sift through the questions that have been popped up live and start to put some answers around a few of those. Um, I'll point out again that um, the, as Matt said, these questions are themed. We've picked a couple that seem to be quite a frequent topic of interest. The first one we'll go to is um, uh, relating to the permissioning framework. What warrants a business needing a registration? Some of you asked and some of you asked a similar question, which is we currently have unlicensed operations. How will we know if permits or registrations are applicable to us as business owners? So the new permissions framework, uh, as you know, includes two new tiers of permission in addition to licenses, permits and registrations. The introduction of the permit and the registration tiers mean that a range of new duty holders will require permission who did not previously require one. This may include situations where an exemption under the current framework has been rehoused as a permit or a registration or where a new activity has been newly brought into the permission scheme. So to work out if your business needs to obtain a license, permit or registration, duty holders should review Schedule 1 of the proposed final regulations. The schedule outlines all the activities which will need a permission from the EPA, as well as the type of permission that is required. In addition, regulations 37 to 42 of the proposed final regulations outline a limited number of prescribed exemptions, though these primarily, primarily relate to license activities at this point. So as I flagged earlier, I think schedule one is a really important place to go to, to find out if your business requires a permission. EPA's website also has some useful information for businesses who want to better understand the permission scheme uh, with some kind of general headings that will point you towards the potential for whether you need a permission or not, and also some information to help understand obligations under the new legislation. If you're still unsure of whether or not your business requires a permission after having had a look at the regs and the website, you can contact EPA by phone or email. And I should point out that a whole bunch of details on how to do that will be provided at the end of this presentation. The next question we picked out, um, we picked out because we thought it was of particular interest um, uh, for those of you in a regional area. How does the new legislation 
deal with historical contamination? And will there be confirmation of background levels for arsenic in the Bendigo region? So as you know, the new act introduces contaminated land duties with special provisions to allow for the consideration of background levels. So EPA is aware of the challenges in the Bendigo region relating to arsenic and will be providing targeted guidance on how to interpret arsenic levels in the Bendigo region for the 1st of July, 2021. Further work to understand the nature and extent of arsenic in the Bendigo region will continue uh, beyond 1st of July, 2021. I'll just hand over to Stephen at this point to answer a, another couple of the questions or themed question areas that were submitted uh, ahead of the event. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks very much, Jackie. Um, so two further pre-submitted questions uh, to walk through. First one is, will the general environmental duty apply to legacy wastewater systems, those without permits? So in short, yes, the general environmental duty will require a person in management or control of an on-site wastewater management system, including a legacy system to take all reasonably practicable steps to minimise the risks of harm from operating the system. So for example, if a system discharges untreated wastewater off-site and into a stormwater drainage system, then an authorised officer appointed by a council under a delegation by EPA may decide there are grounds for issuing a remedial notice, an improvement notice under the new Act. Uh, just to add to that, as I touched on in the presentation, as well as the general environmental duty, direct regulations in part 5.7 will also apply to the maintenance and operation of on-site wastewater management systems. And they'll apply to all on-site wastewater management systems, including older ones that were put in before an installation permit was required. Uh, moving to quite a different question, which was pre-submitted relating to contaminated land. Can EPA provide examples of the definition of Cat D waste soils able to be retained on a project site? So Cat D soils or Cat D waste soils are defined in Schedule 6 of the regulations. And Schedule 6 in turn points to EPA's publication number 1828, which Jackie mentioned earlier. It's called Waste Disposal Categories, Characteristics and Thresholds. Category, category D forms the lower range of the current category C, allowing for a restricted use of waste soil where no further damage to land will occur. And containment of Cat D can be well suited to, for example, large precinct style developments, such as shopping centres or large remediation projects of former industrial sites, spanning multiple property parcels. So under the regulations, an EPA permit will be required to contain Category D waste soil on a project site. This permission activity, which is A17 in Schedule 1, uh, will be assessed by EPA, subject to assessment by EPA. The Category D waste soil has to have been generated on the project site. EPA will specify the land that is the project site in the permit document but it has to be either a single area of land, which is identified in a document as part of an amendment to a planning scheme under the Planning and Environment Act, or land that relates to public works within the meaning of the Environment Effects Act. So here's an example of where such a permit might be sought. Um, imagine soil is excavated as part of development works to convert industrial land to another use. In some cases, the land being developed will be a series of adjoining property parcels that are identified as a single area as part of a planning scheme amendment. Where the soil is identified as Cat D, the duty holder will be able to apply to EPA for an A17 permit to contain the soil elsewhere on the project site. Without this permit, the Cat D soil will need to be sent to a facility that is licensed by EPA to treat or dispose of the Cat D soil. And just quickly, a second example of how the permit might apply. You can imagine Cat D soil may be excavated as part of level crossing removal works. 
the duty holder might wish to apply to EPA for an A17 permit to contain the Cat D soil elsewhere on their project site. If EPA believes it's appropriate, EPA may specify in a permit that the project site includes, say, two level crossings, two level crossing sites, and for example, a dedicated depot. If EPA approves the permit application, the Cat D soil removed from the level crossings will be able to be contained at the depot. So long as the duty holder complies with the conditions in the permit and with any further requirements that may apply under the planning framework. So that's another two pre submitted questions. Jackie. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, now, I'm pretty sure this is the point that we hand over to do some live questions. OK, we've got a couple to get started with, and I just want to reassure everyone I've been watching your questions and they're fantastic. They're very well informed, actually. It's just pretty exciting uh, for us to see the level of engagement that's already been put in. Um, we'll go through some that we can answer here on the spot, but um, we'll also be saving them all and sifting through them and thinking about how we can use them to support and publish answers for the most commonly asked or frequently asked um, themed areas of them. So let's have a look which is first cab off the rank. Actually, first cab I think is yours, Stephen Gatford. There's one on noise that's been shared for us. So the question on noise that's come in during the session is under what circumstances would EPA consider construction noise as unreasonable noise? So EPA has recently released new guidance on how to mitigate construction noise, which is publication 1820. So that's a key component that we'd be looking to. Um, to add to that, the factors of noise that are considered in an assessment of, of unreasonable noise under section 166 of the Act are outlined in the Act, in the definition of unreasonable noise. And they are volume, intensity, duration, character, the time, place, and other circumstances in which the noise is emitted. And it also includes prescribed factors. And during the presentation earlier, I mentioned that frequency spectrum is included in the regulations as a factor that is part of the assessment of whether noise is unreasonable noise. Uh, just to finalise that question, um, EPA is also working on new guidance to be released to support duty holders to manage low frequency noise. Back to you. Chris, are you going to choose another question for us or do you want me just to plunge in? Yeah, I've actually got one for Matt, so more around the uh, around the ACT, ACT implementation. Um, and excuse me while I, I might just take my camera off because I'm reading from the screen here. So Matt, the question is, um, has EPA prepared a document that concisely compares existing and future changes, in particular to SEP, WMP, IWMP, works approval, licenses, recycled water, EIPs, etc. Thanks, Chris. Sorry, just waiting to make sure that um, I've uh, read my cue and like uh, the first time up. Um, look, the direct answer to the question is that the nature and scale of the change is something that's not readily accommodated by a single concise document. Uh, and I think probably uh, today's presentation and, and the Q&A um, affirms that. Uh, so our preferred approach is to support education through um, a fairly broad range of documents, uh, channels, platforms and, and so forth. Um, an overview of the permissions framework, including the, the transition of the new permissions instruments um, into, uh, into the new legislation is available on our website now um, in the form of our draft permissions policy. Um, we are also currently preparing a document that looks at the SEPs and the WOMPs and explains how they've been translated across from the old to the, or I should say the current to the new legislative framework um, and, and that will be released in conjunction with the making of the subordinate legislation. Uh, but overall, uh, bespoke guidance um, around particular areas of change is, um, has been determined to, to be the most effective approach there. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. 
Okay, the next one is for Jackie. Uh, will there be a grace period for landfills to accept soil sampled under 621? Or will the 40 new 1828 analytes be mandatory from 1 July? Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm really happy to see this question because it gives us an opportunity to offer some reassurance that we've been looking for. Um, I guess the first, my, my opinion is the grace period is perhaps less necessary than the question asker might think. Um, when classifying soil, duty holders must test for all contaminants that are reasonably expected to be in the soil. Um, there is not a requirement to test for every contaminant or analyte listed in EPA publication 1828. That's a really important point. Um, and, I, and I must say that um, the consultation process that we went through on the subordinate legislation was a little bit of a learning curve for us because we hadn't realised to what extent some duty holders viewed that list as being mandatory, all encompassing, must test for everything at all times. So I suppose I'm answering your question in a slightly oblique way, which is yes, there is a requirement from 1st of July. However, that requirement is only for you to test for contaminants or analytes that you reasonably expect to be in the soil. We're not asking you to suddenly add a list of 40 every time you go to think about testing. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Jackie. We have another one for you, Jackie. Does the approach to air, including inventories and odours, capture greenhouse gases as pollutants? Thanks, Chris. Um, this is an issue that came through really strongly in our submissions process. And for those of you who are interested to learn a little more, I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at the response to public comment report, which is a Victorian government report um, that was published to capture the way that various issues were treated through the submissions. So whilst the draft environment protection regulations, or I should say the proposed final this time, uh, do not include direct reference to greenhouse gases, they have been developed in the context of the Victorian government's whole of government commitments and programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, including under the Climate Change Act 2017, including under the government's long-term vision and approach to climate change, which of course is set out in Victoria's climate change framework. That climate change framework sets out a shared vision for net zero emissions, climate resilient Victoria in 2050. It sets out how action on climate change aligns with the government's focus on jobs and cost of living and health, and the steps the government is taking to commence the transition, including importantly, how the Climate Change Act will drive action. So I think the point we're trying to make is that although the regulations at this point don't have that level of specificity, um, we're pointing you towards the climate change framework as being the primary framework to address that risk at this time. The Climate Change Act also has some specific obligations for EPA here. The Climate Change Act requires EPA when making a decision under the new Environment Protection Act for a license or a permit and including review of an operating license to take into account the potential impacts of climate change relevant to the decision or action the potential contribution of the decision or action to the state's greenhouse gas emissions and any guidelines issued by the Minister under the Climate Change Act. So having said all of that, nonetheless, the general environmental duty applies to the risk of harm from greenhouse gas emissions and therefore requires action towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions by individuals, businesses and all parts of government. Thanks there, Jackie. Uh, we have one on, the, on water actually, which is for Stephen. So it's simply which clauses of SEP waters will be kept? Uh, thanks, Chris. So um, just to clarify, the clauses will be kept for two years from commencement of the new framework. So uh, until mid 2023, based on the intended commencement on 1 July 2021. Um, the clauses are actually set out in the transitional regulations, the proposed final transitional regulations, which are published on EPA's website, specifically in regulation seven. Um, they cover um, aspects relating to on-site domestic wastewater management, uh, sewerage planning, sediment ponds, stormwater management plans, saline discharges, irrigation drains and pollutant load targets. And the clause numbers, again, if you look at regulation seven of the transitional regulations, you'll see the clause numbers, but just quickly, 
clause 28 sub 1 and 2, clause 29, clause 30, clause 34, 3 and 4, clause 35, 1, 5 and 6, clause 37 and schedule 4 of set waters. Back to you, Chris. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, this one is for, for Jackie. If a site was cleaned up under a CUN in the past, but then groundwater is contaminated again years later, for example, due to water level changes, is there a duty to notify? I told you there were some pretty educated questions coming through, didn't I? Look, um, the answer is potentially. Uh, it won't be a one size fits all answer. It will really depend on if the contamination uh, is regarded as a material change to what was assumed and addressed under the original notice. Uh, EPA is providing further guidance on what might constitute a material change. Uh, in any case, if there's some new or a change in contamination, the contamination will only be notifiable if it meets the criteria in the regs. So I hope that's clear. Uh, I guess we had to have one question that the answer was it depends, right? Otherwise, uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a regulator if we weren't answering that from time to time. But again, pointing you back to the criteria in the regs to have a look for yourself and consider how it might apply to the particular scenario. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Uh, I think we've just got a question coming in here. Stephen Gafford, with regard to existing financial assurance, will it be possible to review under the new regulations? Thanks, Chris. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the act rather than the regulations um, provides uh, the ability for duty holders to apply to EPA uh, to review their financial assurance obligations. Um, and the Act also provides for EPA to revise individual financial assurances from time to time. Uh, for example, if the amount of material that a site is storing increases or decreases, that could prompt EPA to revise an aspect of an individual financial assurance. Thanks, Chris. All right, thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, actually, we we did have a question there on compliance codes. So I can see here that there's a question which reads, the new access provision for compliance codes, can you please advise what the compliance codes will address and when they will be released? So that's a great question. In fact, the new act sets provision for a range of instruments um, besides regulations. And before I answer your question on compliance codes, which I will, I'll just kind of point out that um, we're taking a staged approach to the development of all of the instruments enabled under the Act, including subordinate legislation. Today, we're here to talk to you about the regulations and the environment reference standards. We moved on a little bit from the subordinate legislation and we talked a little bit about determinations and designations. We chose those as our first priority um, for the non-regulation instruments or for the other instruments. The reason we chose them as first priority is that they were critical to the legal functioning of the framework for 1st of July in some instances. Um, it was important that they were in place to support the regs, particularly some of the lawful place duties in the regs as well. So our priorities first were for the regs and the standards uh, in partnership with the department. Secondly, determinations and designations to fill the gaps in the legal framework and make sure that the lawful place duties were smoothly transitioned into. Looking ahead, you're absolutely right, question asker. Compliance codes are something we're interested in doing. I would point out though that um, WorkSafe, which is the model we've used to inform our approach to compliance codes over its entire lifespan has had something like 15 compliance codes, um, a really quite small number. So compliance codes are, are not something that's generated frequently. Um, they're not a missing layer that we all have to wait for to understand how the framework operates. They are instruments that will be developed from time to time, largely to address um, specific practical challenges. Um, I'll, Again, the WorkSafe example is helpful. WorkSafe has a compliance code on working with heights, I think. Um, it might have another compliance code on particular other kinds of hazards or individual practices. Now, I think at the moment we nominated as part of our subordinate legislation program that we would um, use the landfill BEPM. What does BEPM stand for? I struggle with that one, I must say. But we would use the landfill BEPM as a core set of knowledge to transition into a compliance code. We thought it would make a great 
pilot compliance code. And we started working with uh, the sector a little while ago, leading up to um, the original commencement date of the Act last year. When the Act was deferred, we realised it kind of meant we didn't have to rush. So we took the decision to put it on pause, move, uh, move our focus to determinations, and then later on, probably late this year or early next year, we'll be picking up that landfill compliance code again. So the answer to the question is, we're interested in compliance codes. They aren't our first priority. They shouldn't be seen as necessary for the functioning of the framework for day one. And the first one we've indicated interest in progressing is, is around landfills. Thanks, Jackie. Oh, and I can see someone's explained to me that BEPM stands for Best Practice Environmental Management. Thank you. I get a little bit overwhelmed with acronyms at times, people. <laughs> Yeah, and we will, when, so as we committed to at the start of the meeting, we um, we said we would wrap up uh, the, the themes of the meeting. Uh, there's a lot that have come in uh, and we've got some good themes happening already. We have attempted to answer a number of those themes questions here, um, but, you know, in, in regards to acronyms, we'll, we'll spell them out, obviously, when we put up our published, um, published themed questions, uh, which will be available in the next few weeks. Um, just looking to the, the team to see if there's any more questions to come because we are, um, we're close to time, but we're just, we're, we're a bit ahead of time, which is great. So I reckon let's move towards showing people where some links are to find other information because a whole bunch of those questions basically said, where can I find out more? So that's I reckon right. that's the best way to do it. And we can take our time with the rest of them because some of them are quite technical. That's right, and we have, so basically, um, I have noticed a lot of questions around guidance and around you know where, where are things available. We we have updated our website, and I, I'm sure most of those on the line know. But I, I would really emphasise that you bookmark the epa.vic.gov.au forward slash new laws um, as in your in your favourite browser because we have so much information going up there and it continues to go up. We will, um, we will provide information from this webinar up there in due course, but there's already a stack of guidance and I'll just read some of it to you. Um, the thing also, which is great, so we had a lot of people um, from industry associations, uh, uh, environmental auditors, etc. cetera. It's, um, you know, imperative for anyone in business basically to keep up with the new laws, you subscribe to our uh, new, sorry, to our EPA bulletins. So we have uh, bulletins for business, bulletins for, sorry, there's just someone on the line. Can you please mute yourself? Um, bulletins for business, we have the community bulletin, your environment, um, your EPA and a local government bulletin. A lot of interest from local government here on the chat and uh, the question and answer and also uh, in the pre-submitted questions too. So please sign up because it goes straight into your inbox. As mentioned at the start, for those who joined us late, these links will be provided to you. The presentation will be provided to you at the end and in due course recordings will be provided to you as well. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, so, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, a good way to keep in touch with the new laws. I think over time, there's going to be more of a ramp up around the new laws as we get closer to that commencement date on the 1st of July, uh, because a lot of what we, we put on social media at, at the moment is, you know, to do with current issues and that kind of thing. But keep an eye on that. There's some great information available. Something I really wanted to point out, which has been briefly mentioned in, in the presentations today are the sector guides. Um, we have a number of sector guides available. So when you're on that new laws website, please check out our sector guides, the ones that are relevant to you. And if you're an industry association or a consultant to, to the members that you deal with, your clients. Um, so we encourage you to look at these. There's a, there's a version one out at the moment. Uh, what we're doing, is work is currently underway and adding more information to the sector guides, what we call stage two. 
some of which pertains to requirements in the proposed regulation. So what you heard from Jackie and Stephen today, really key information. We aim to release the stage two sector guides prior to the new legislation taking, in, taking effect. So on the screen there, you can see uh, the, the retail and small business uh, sector guide there. That is um, an example, I think, of seven that we have. Um, so, you know, check that out. As I mentioned, the recording slides and relevant links will be made available to all who have registered today. I wanted to just do a big shout out, particularly to all the people who have gone online, registered, not only registered, you know, and, and got a, a put, put through some key questions. That has helped us mould this session beautifully today. Uh, we thank you so much for your input. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, just reiterating that we're going to publish some of our most commonly asked question themes and the corresponding answers on our website. Uh, we do encourage you know, for issues and other things that have come up which may not have been answered today that you call our contact centre, 1300 EPA VIC, that's 1300 372 842. The, the purpose of today's webinar was on the new laws, but we do take uh, pollution reports, etc., very seriously. That's our job. So uh, you can also email us at um, contact at epa.vic.gov.au. Uh, there will be a survey available um, in the Eventbrite, through the Eventbrite process, so uh, we're not providing that right now. Uh, it's just, it's just, you know, it's, um, oh, actually I've just got a note saying it's been posted into the Q&A, uh, so excuse me, I had thought that was going to come in later. It is coming in now, nice work team. So Q&A will be in the, in, in there in front of you now. Uh, sorry, I'm not the best news reader here. And uh, yeah, so please keep an eye out for that. And look, just wanted to say a final thanks for joining us today. It's been a huge effort from all the team. And we, yeah, as we said, subscribe to our bulletins, bookmark the website, keep in touch, and we hope to see you really soon at something like this that we, that we may do again um, on more specific themes, but we'll have a, um, Another thing to mention actually that I just did neglect to mention is we have something called the readiness roadmap. So that is on the new new laws website. Please, um, that gives you a good idea of what's coming up. We do have a number of sessions coming up on specific themes. Um, and the waste tracker one that, that, that Jackie mentioned, uh, that will be in, I think on the 23rd of Feb. So please keep an eye out for that for anyone who's um, that's relevant to. But enough from me. Thanks for joining us this afternoon and um, we hope that you enjoyed the session.